All right, good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the 125th meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Uh, today's meeting is a, a, a little bit different than our, our usual meetings. We have a single topic today, really two presentations, one by Mohican Sun Mass LLC and the other by Wind Mass LLC, to talk about uh, an issue that uh, is um, at the, uh, at, uh, uh, at issue, uh, talk about an issue that uh, we need to evaluate as part of our evaluation of the applications. Both have filed for the Category 1 casino in uh, the uh, Region A, and that is the traffic plans and, and the um, uh, methods and means for getting to and from uh, the casinos that ultimately, uh, the casino that ultimately will be licensed. So that's our sole topic today. Uh, uh, and we're going to ask uh, both uh, Mohegan Sun and Wynn uh, to present uh, uh, to us uh, their idea of the traffic plans. Um, one has to understand that everything that's uh, said today is somewhat fluid because there's a permitting process going on that is required by the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Act, and that has a number of components, and those components will uh, linger uh, long after uh, the license award has been made. But today we get an overview of uh, what uh, the applicants have in mind and an opportunity to ask them questions about it. We are, of course, going to have uh, public meetings, one in Revere next Tuesday evening uh, from 4 to 8, and uh, then the next one on Wednesday evening from uh, 4 to 8 in Everett. Uh, both of those are posted. The location is uh, available on our website. Uh, at which we will be discussing uh, all aspects uh, of the applications that both have made. So this is a, a preview of an important part of those applications, and hopefully this will clarify some issues and give people um, ideas uh, about things to be inquiring about when we meet next week. So with that as a prologue, and without further ado, I'm going to turn the proceedings <coughs> over to our ombudsman, John Ziemba, who's been working closely with the applicants and with our um, consultants uh, on these issues and uh, ask you, Mr. Zim, if you would, to take it from here. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. So to give you a little bit of an overview of what's going to happen today, we've asked each of the applicant teams to come and present uh, the latest updates on their transportation plans uh, in the context of their RFA 2 filings. Uh, pursuant to our regulations 205 CMR 120 uh, and 205 CMR 125, uh, applicants under, are under, under an obligation to provide uh, updates regarding their MEPA activities, their filings with MEPA to the Commission. We take note of those in our evaluations. Uh, and also surrounding community agreements are often executed after uh, the applications are filed. Uh, we also take note of those as a part of our reviews. So for today, uh, each of the uh, applicant teams will provide uh, the latest information. Uh, we have asked uh, the applicants uh, to provide a, a presentation of approximately, uh, with all questions from the commissioners and our consultants, approximately an hour and a half, but there's a hard stop at two hours for each of the uh, presentations today. Uh, so the, the way that, the, that it will proceed is we've asked uh, the applicants to give their initial presentation uh, to the degree that commissioners or our consultant teams have any uh, very specific questions for clarification during those presentations, uh, we, we can ask those questions, but what we think uh, would be most efficient would be to allow the applicants to give their presentations. Uh, and thereafter, we can have some questions from uh, the commissioners, uh, and then we would have much more specific questions uh, from our consultant team. Uh, we are joined by uh, uh, Rick Moore from City Point Partners and Jason Sobel from Green International, and they'll help, uh, help us through the reviews today. So um, uh, one thing I will mention is that uh, both uh, the applicants uh, have been told that uh, what we're trying to do here today is to review uh, the existing information and plan MEPA-related information. Um, uh, there is uh, uh, still ongoing some negotiations with the City of Boston, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we are very sensitive to, to those negotiations, so to the degree that there's any, uh, any information that ha has to remain um, a part of those negotiations, uh, we're not expecting that to be divulged at today's hearing. So uh, in that regard, uh, I would like to ask the Mohegan Sun, uh, uh, Mohegan Sun team to join us. We are uh, being joined by Gary Litteritz, Vice President of Operations and Development, Jeff Mullen from Foley-Hoag and John Kennedy from VHB. 
Uh, in addition, Brian Falk from the city of Revere, representing the city of Revere, is also in attendance if we have any further questions. Uh, but uh, from that point, I'll ask them to begin their presentations. Thank you, John. Good morning, commissioners. Members Good morning. Of morning. morning. Members of the staff. My name, as uh, John uh, Zamba mentioned, is Gary Luteritz. I'm vice president for operations and development at Mohegan Sun, and I am the manager for our project here in, uh, in Massachusetts. I want to thank you for giving us this chance to present our overall transportation plan. Uh, we think it's comprehensive, and I hope that that attribute will be reflected in what you see in our presentation today. Uh, before I go any further, though, I'd like to, to uh, introduce my compatriots that are with me. Uh, frankly, they represent the science and the knowledge that uh, has driven our work in, in transportation. I have to tell you, it's a little, it's a little scary. Uh, I have uh, spent a lot of time with them over these many months, and uh, I have become one with the transportation world. Uh, you know, I, 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 I come up to a stop at an intersection, I'm analyzing signalization and pedestrian movements, and uh, it's, been, it's been quite an undertaking. So, uh, uh, so with that, let me introduce uh, Jeff Mullen, the former Secretary of Transportation with the Commonwealth and John Kennedy. John is a principal with VHB. VHB is our, is our consulting uh, arm for transportation here in the Boston area. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge, as, as uh, Mr. Ziemba mentioned, um, from the city of Revere. Um, with us today is, uh, is Brian Falk. Brian is the counsel for the city. Um, also, uh, Bob Button and uh, Dan Murphy, both of whom are with CDM Consulting. The CDM Smith, sorry, the consulting arm for, uh, for the city as well. And of course, uh, those gentlemen are with us too in case we get into any questions that may be city related. Uh, we're, we're pleased to have them here with us. So you've been to uh, our site in Revere. And um, I think you've seen firsthand the, the great location that we have there. We're very proud of, of the transportation plan that we put together to complement that site. We spent really thousands of hours collectively putting this plan together. Uh, today we're going to present it to you and we're going to get into a pretty extraordinary level of detail. We're, we're really going, going to get into the weeds and, uh, uh, and try to, to really bring this to, to life and, and I hope we can accomplish that. Our presentation um, is going to have five parts but, uh, and, and we'll go through those parts but I, I, in spite of Mr. Ziemba's comments, um, I would urge you if, you, if you feel the need to interrupt us uh, during the process, please do. Uh, if, you, if you would like to have a dialogue uh, about something so you don't forget it, uh, you know, we, we certainly welcome that dialogue. Thank you. So our presentation will have five parts. I'll start by giving some highlights of the plan in, in just a moment. Uh, Jeff Mullen, with uh, John's support, will give us an overall approach, what we've learned, uh, the details of our transportation plan, and then I will sum it up very briefly at the end uh, with, a, with a summary overview. There's four principal highlights that I wanted to mention. As we can see on the, scre on the screen, this is a truly multimodal approach, and we hope we can express that to you. We have immediate access to the T, and we're going to talk a lot about that. That's an important aspect of this. We are spending more than $45 million in private funding for roadway improvements that not only will mitigate issues for the pro that the project may, may uh, bring along, but it's going to solve long-standing regional uh, problems in, in the area on the North Shore. And frankly, our plan is complete, and we think it works. Turning to the multimodal approach, the, um, the plan as you'll see as we go through it, uh, and, and I won't go through all these items, and we're going to go through them in detail, uh, addresses a number of, of practical transportation uh, uh, aspects from uh, pedestrian movements to vehicular to the T. We're committed to getting patrons and employees to the resort by virtually every practical mode of transportation. And we can do that, we think, because we've got a superior location. We've got ideal roadway access. Uh, in today's large uh, urban environment, these large developments 
have to have a complete multimodal plan and, and pay close attention to every aspect of transportation. And we think we've accomplished that. So we'll go through the multimodal approach. We have immediate access to the T. This is really the centerpiece of a transportation plan. It, it represents the present as well as the future of a smart transportation plan, we believe. The Beachmont Station, for example, you know, it's 150 feet. Perhaps that's 50 steps from our entrance and our main entrance. This, uh, this next photograph uh, is a before and after photo. And I know, uh, as, as I said, you've been out to our site. Uh, the lower photo uh, represents uh, a, a point of view from the entrance to the Beachmont Blue Line Station, looking back at the site as it exists today. And then uh, the upper photo uh, shows uh, uh, that site, that same point of view with the site developed. I mean, it, it's really going to be a magnificent entryway as you step off of that T, and we've tried to integrate it in a way where it can touch all of the region simply by stepping off the T into our site. And of course, that, that was also the, the, uh, the quality view that you'd see from the neighborhood as well. The third highlight is our roadway improvements. As I mentioned, more than $45 million in infrastructure improvements and that will also address long-standing regional impacts. We're going to perform mitigation at 21 different locations. And these improvements don't just offer the impacts, as I mentioned, from the project. Uh, they'll solve uh, many issues, and we're going to go through some of those issues and, and, and show you as we go through maybe not all intersections, but a lot of these intersections, why we thought they were important, what the study showed, and how we're going to mitigate them. This map uh, shows uh, in blue, in, in the form of blue dots, and Jeff is going to go through this in a little bit more detail to, to make sure that you're properly oriented, but it shows all of the 20, 21 locations that we have uh, provided some mitigation. And each one of these, by the way, uh, is either a traffic roadway improvement, operational improvement, or, or, or addressed uh, safety conditions at those sites. In a lot of cases, we wanted to address pedestrians as well. So the final highlight, as I mentioned, is that our plan is complete and it works. We will improve every intersection that will experience a measurable impact. There's no reliance on any third parties. We have committed to pay for each of these solutions. There's no taxpayer money that's needed. Our guests will step from the T to our front door. There's no intervening shuttle buses that will be needed. Visitors, both international and national, will be able to get seamlessly to and from Logan Airport from our site. So with that, I'd like to hand the microphone over to Jeff Mullen, who's now going to get truly into the weeds Thank you, on Gary. this issue. Uh, Jesse, can you move to slide 14, please? <clears throat> Just before I begin my remarks, and I'm going to talk about our overall approach and, and our detailed plan, I thought I might take a minute to orient the commission and actually focus on this slide. Commissioner. Zienga, Zienga <clears throat> mentioned this. We had a conversation about the fact that he claims to live on the South Shore and then revealed the fact that he actually lives in Jamaica Plain, which <clears throat> I told him is Western Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> uh, but regardless, regardless of that, I'll, I'll just point out where we are here. The, the Mohegan site is, is in the purple. Uh, the, this is the Rose Candy Greenway, the O'Neill Tunnel, the Williams Tunnel, the airport, of course, East Boston, Revere. Uh, most of our surrounding communities are in here. I just want to properly orient the, the commission. Revere Beach Parkway uh, moves across the region uh, and, of course, uh, up uh, route, uh, route 1A up to the North Shore. So, Jesse, take it. Is that, is that, is that helpful? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, slide 12, our overall approach. Um, a couple of slides about how we began, and um, I want to I want to give kudos and credit to John Kennedy and his team at Vanessa Hang and Brusselin, who've been with this project for for quite a long time and who've done a tremendous amount of work in getting us to the point we are today. Um, we did a public transportation study and analysis, which, as Gary indicated, forms the centerpiece of of what we're proposing to, to build and to provide to the Commonwealth. Uh, we projected public transportation by comparing the Mohegan Sun Resort with other urban casinos in the United States, and frankly, there aren't many that have 
the same kind of char characteristics. There is the Horseshoe Casino in, in Cleveland, which is built on and near a, a rapid transit site, but we also know that Cleveland doesn't have the same kind of transit ridership that Boston does. Um, but nevertheless, that's a, that's a data point that we use. We also looked at Aqueduct and it, and it, um, at uh, 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 casinos in Philadelphia and, and other casinos around the nation that have urban characteristics. We analyzed the MBTA service within our own catchment area, what the buses provide, what the boats provide, what the rapid transit provides, and what the commuter rail provides, and how people get to and from Logan Airport and uh, around our area. And um, we analyzed the peculiarities or the particulars of how people get to work and uh, use the T for non-work purposes. And I think those are all three critical parts of our public transportation ridership. We also looked at the, the, um, the, the particular aspects of our site, which as, as Gary indicated several times, we've got immediate proximity uh, to the Blue Line. And we know that the Blue Line is one of the MBTA's highest performing lines. It has a, a fair bit of capacity. It's recently been expanded and it operates quite well. Um, we looked at the high level of transit acceptance in the Boston area and the importance of the MBTA, particularly for employees' commutes, but also for tourists and for, uh, for others who use and rely on the T. And we looked at the extensive need for a transportation uh, demand program on, a, on all urban sites and as required by the Commonwealth. Um, and that led to uh, a, a, you know, our decision to put, place significant limitations on employee parking. And lastly, our team has worked very closely with the Department of Transportation and the MBTA on the types of assumptions that, uh, that, that went into this and, and came out of the study. And I can report to you that there is concurrence with those assumptions. The second thing we did was a traffic study. I say we, but VHB did a traffic study. Now, I've read your reports for Springfield and for Plain, Plain Ridge. And, and I, I know and I can report to you that our traffic study was very similar to the ones that have been provided to you and have been analyzed by your expert consultant team. It, it is, uh, the, the study and analysis was very consistent, entirely consistent with what MassDOT, MEPA, and the Department of Cons Conservation and Recreation require. We did data collection and analysis of existing condition. Now this includes data that we generated on our own, that we studied, and we looked at available data from public agencies. We did a helicopter flight of the area to literally count cars during one uh, particular Friday. Um, we did studies on trip generation and distribution, and I'll, I'll go into the details of that. And we, we looked at Mohegan's gravity model and, and try to understand or understand better about where people are coming from and, and their customer shed, if you will. We looked at future traffic growth and improved developments, developments that we know are on the horizon between today and 2022 for the purpose of MEPA, and between today and 2032 for the purpose of Route 1A. So we are look, literally looking out to 2032 with respect to traffic on, on Route 1A and 2032 with respect to the, to the study area. VHB then, build and, uh, then created a build and a no-build transportation network, which is going to be detailed in, a, in our supplemental draft environmental impact report. And then we developed a mitigation plan that is consistent with industry standards, and I think we'll, uh, we agree, we believe that it is a market leader. The next slide is a map of the study area that was, was requested by the DOT and, and, and uh, uh, confirmed by MEPA in our earlier filings. The, the blue dots represent the 28 intersections that uh, VHB has studied, uh, this being the Bremen Street uh, area, Neptune Road, a 1A intersection where Bennington Street runs into Route 1A North. Uh, these, of course, are the tunnels. Uh, 1A follows up this way. We've got Route 60 going through the city of Revere. That's an important road, and we'll talk about that. Route 1 coming from the north uh, in the Revere, Revere Beach Parkway. And these are some local intersections nearby the site that we'll talk about, including the importance of Donnelly Square and the uh, access to our sites. The third thing that we did was we did a tremendous amount of outreach, outreach throughout the region. Now this outreach reach began in a, with the original proponent's uh, proposal and continued when, when Mohegan Sun uh, became responsible for advocating and, and advancing the proposal. This includes weekly meetings with the city of Revere, dozens of meetings with the DOT and the T. Um, several public forums in the city of Revere, presentations to community groups, and all of the things that you would expect and indeed demand of a development of this, of this, uh, of this magnitude. 
that outreach was complemented by a significant amount of work with our surrounding communities. This is a map showing the voluntary surrounding communities we executed with 11 communities. Add to, the, add to that the city of Revere, and we've got six agreements that we've signed with the uh, communities that uh, are most proximate to the site. You'll see in the south, uh, that's, uh, that's the city of Boston, and of course, as, as the Ombudsman indicated, we remain in negotiations with the city of Boston and are hopeful for an agreement with the city as well, which would bring our surrounding community plan to 12, uh, plus uh, the host community agreement with Revere, so 13 agreements. These agreements offer, in my opinion, offer, in our opinion, offer these communities a seat at the table and an, an offer to, to share information and to become informed about the design and construction of the resort as we proceed. So what did we learn from all of that, uh, all of that work? We learned a few things. We learned our travel demand. We learned that demand is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation. We learned that demand is spread out over the week, throughout the day, but that Friday and Saturday are our peak days. You will not be surprised to hear that. I think every gaming uh, proponent who's come before you has reached the same conclusion. We, we, we learned that, fortunately, the peak traffic uh, comes after the PM commuting peak. Uh, uh, so that we might say in transportation parlance, we're not peaking the peak. Um, and we learned that our, we have very limited tr tr trips in the AM peak, which is important for Route 1A since a lot of people are focused on the southbound move from the North Shore into the Williams and Sumner tunnels. And we learned that employee trips are spread throughout the day with our staggered work shifts. We don't have large peaks in our employee trips. As a practical matter, employees don't add a lot to the overall volume of traffic, but nevertheless an important component and something that we've paid a fair bit of attention to. In terms of our trip distribution based on that study, we project that at least 30% of our employees will use public transportation. The vast majority of the remaining employees will use our, our interceptor shuttle plan, which we detailed in our RFA2 application and have supplemented to you. Uh, we'll get into the details of how that interceptor shuttle plan works. Um, but uh, that plan stems from the fact that we've severely limited parking for employees on the site. We've got 4,500 or so employee uh, total parking spaces at the site, and only employees uh, that have physical disabilities or our high-level senior management employees will be able to park at the site. That's a transportation demand measure. It's designed to leverage the T. It's designed to get our employees out of the cars into multiple occupancy vehicles. We've also projected that 11% of our patrons will use public transportation. Um, we hope for more, but that's a projection. We believe that to be conservative. And because of the unique geography of our catchment area that I'll, just, I'll explain in the next slide, um, we project that nearly 70% of our vehicle trips will come from the south on Route 1A. Next slide. Do the, um, excuse me. Yes. Do the, uh, the patrons using public transportation, is their peak kind of mirror mirroring the, uh, the, the car traffic? It's throughout the day, but we'll, we'll get, oh, mirroring the car traffic. Or do you see them using public transportation at a different peak time? We think that our patrons will use the, uh, the facility throughout the day, um, but I think the trip, trip distribution will be very similar. Okay. We'll also show you in a couple of slides how our, our projected traffic interacts with the MBTA service demand plans, uh, service capacity plans, and the MBTA's own, own our ridership studies. Thank you. So this is an interesting slide that, I, that we put in. I know it's difficult to read, but it, it's the, this uh, on the left is a projection of where our employees will come from. This representing the true North Shore. This would be the Northwest area. This uh, for, uh, would, be, would be, let's call it West, Metro West, Jamaica Plain, et cetera. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was going to remark that it, that it is in the West. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then all the rest of the, of the folks, uh, like myself, from the South. Uh, Jeff, this is patrons, not tourists. Uh, uh, yeah, these are, these are where our customers come from. Um, and and uh, we've, we've got percentages of how many we project. And the reason that's important is we took this customer shed and built a regional trip network based on the regional roadways. And the, the, the reason we're now we're saying that 70% are coming through 1A is that these people in the blue, many of them will get on 93 into town and, and through the Callahan Tunnel to access. So while they begin their trip in the north, 
because of the way that the, South, uh, the Interstate 93 and the O'Neill Tunnel works, we believe that they'll be using the Callahan Tunnel to access the site th through Route 1A. Similarly, traffic from the west and from the south, those patrons will be using the O'Neill Tunnel. The Central Ottery Tunnel Project was designed to take traffic from the south and the west through the Williams Tunnel to the airport and traffic from the north through the Callahan Tunnel. So that it's a feature of our regional transportation network that we've recognized. We all, you'll also see, if you close examination of these numbers, that there are more people coming to the site through the tunnel than are departing the site. This is because of the tolling system that we currently have in place. That may change, and the Commission should be aware of that. I think that these numbers will flatten out once MassDOT moves to two-way tolling in the tunnels, and that's something that we're also anticipating and well aware of. Uh, the third thing we, we've, we, we learned is about, um, is about our transportation network connections. We learned that there are intersections that cause regional congestion that people are well aware of, such as Boardman Street and 1A, that have caused congestion for many, many years and that this is an opportunity to address them. Another one is Bell Circle, uh, a safety condition at Copeland Circle, which will be addressed as a result of the project. We learned that uh, new ridership on the M MBTA system will be generated, which will be good for the T and good for our project and good for the environment. We learned that notwithstanding that ridership, we believe that Beachmont Station and the Blue Line in particular can accommodate that. Indeed, the busiest day for MBTA trip generation um, never approaches the Blue Line's peak load capacity. And um, in order to uh, demonstrate our commitment to the MBTA, we're working closely with them on a on a uh, network of improvements to Beachmont Station. This next slide shows th the proximity of our site, which is here, represented by the barns at Suffolk Downs. This is Suffolk Downs Route 1A. This is uh, Route 145 Revere Beach Parkway. And each of the lines represents an MBTA bus line. Here is the blue line. And as you can see, the MBTA is, is at our northwest corner. This slide will address Commissioner Stebbins' uh, question. Uh, maybe I'll take a minute to explain what this is. This gold line represents the MBTA's service standards, according to what it refers to as its blue book. The dark blue indicates inbound volume, that is from Wonderland to Bowdoin, depending on the time of day, hours, volume. The light blue represents the outbound, Bowdoin to Wonderland. And what this shows, decision makers, is where the capacity is in the blue line. You can see that in the AM peak, if you will, traffic, and, and this is the most heavily congested piece of the blue line. So this is between Maverick and Aquarium, again, for our conservative analysis. This is not the condition at Beachmont. So this represents the maximum number of people on the blue line between Maverick Station and Aquarium Station today by hour dark blue inbound, light blue outbound. And what you're seeing here is where the capacity in the MBTA exists. So what the MBTA service standards say is there more people can be tolerated in the AM peak and the PM peak than they can be at nighttime. And the reason why this is important is here where that capacity standard is exceeded doesn't mean the train is crowded. It means it's over capacity as against the service standard. So that no one is suggesting that at 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock in the evening, the blue line is actually overcrowded, but there are more people there than the service standard currently tolerates. So that might be a crush load. Uh, most of your capacity, of course, is here. This is where people stand up here. But of course, if you increased your capacity, you wouldn't have a capacity issue. And that's all about MBTA service standards. The next slot, this is during the weekday. That's during the weekday. This, is the, this next is the same slide on a Saturday, which shows that not many people use the MBTA on a Saturday as compared to the service standards. It's relatively flat. And Commissioner Stebbins, this is a, a, the weekend condition. Uh, we generally don't see the same kind of peaking conditions you do during the weekday. In other words, people move around the day, uh, move around uh, fairly consistently through the day. You can see that. Uh, there is a little bit of a bell curve on the outbound uh, and a, a slight on the inbound, but nothing compared to the weekday. So that's, that's existing. These next two slides will show you what the future 
we've built in, in the model that VHB built, they added projected transit ridership from all of the developments that have been proposed and the Mohegan Sun plan through 2022. And you can see that there are a couple of conditions where under the service standard, the capacity will be exceeded. But as a practical matter, the blue line will not be overcrowded using the peak periods as a benchmark. Again, inbound, outbound, AM peak, PM peak. The next slide shows our busiest day is Saturday. Imagine a Saturday afternoon uh, where people are, are seeking to access the resort. There was plenty of capacity on the blue line through 2032. So now we want to go through the five points of our transportation plan. Consists of roadway improvements, TDM measures, transportation demand measures, transportation demand management measures. Is there a question? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Commissioner. Commissioner. Can you come back a little bit to the previous slide? Yeah. Um, one, one more. On the weekdays, um, where, you, uh, where you make the projection. So what if um, the 11% that you project uh, uh, people, um, patrons, would use uh, turns out to be more? Uh, which would be, on the one hand, uh, a good thing for, uh, for public transportation, but uh, how, does, how would that uh, affect, have an effect here? And um, I suspect perhaps that the T would, would respond by adding capacity or something you similar. You know, it's a great question. We don't think, you know, you've got six, came, six car train sets now, and of course, uh, a few years back, the MBTA extended the platforms to accommodate the six car train sets. I don't think the, the, that we'll be looking at additional cars on the trains. Uh, what, you, what, what may happen in 2022 is we may want to, or the MBTA may want to, or Mohegan Sun would work with people to uh, increase the headways, to add more, more uh, increase the, the frequency with which the cars run. But I don't think that's going to happen given the capacity and given the fact that the base is so large. So the MBTA accommodates a million people a day. and. Uh, even if we increase, dramatically increase the patron ridership, as we hope to do, and one of our goals, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful, and I think a lot of people are hopeful that the MBTA gets more and better ridership as the years go on. I don't think it's going to have a measurable impact on the overall capacity of the Blue Line. These, these, uh, these graphs show that, that there's room, there's significant room um, over and above the red that, um, that, that we are impacting the, the, uh, the Blue Line. So uh, uh, we, we think there's room to grow. So we have roadway and safety improvements that I'll walk through, our TDM plan, our employee and patron shuttles, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about water transportation as we must for any, any proposal that is multimodal. And then we'll talk about our commitment to bicycle and, uh, bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. With respect to the roadway improvements, I'm going to walk through uh, seven particular locations of the 21 at which Mohegan Sun has proposed improvements, everything from Route 1A to Copeland Circle. Um, and, but I, I want the commission to be aware, and I'll uh, report that there are many, many other roadway improvements that are proposed, large and small, but each strategically advanced to either relieve congestion, improve level of service, uh, time through the intersection, if you will, or, uh, or uh, implement an important safety, um, uh, uh, safety uh, plan. I'll tell you that, in particular, our host community, Revere, has been very concerned and very interested in increasing Pedestrian, pedestrian safety at several locations, and you'll see that in our plan, and the same is true for the city of Boston. Here are, here are the, here's a map showing the 21 locations at which we've proposed improvements. It's the same map that you'll see several times during this, during this presentation. Copeland Circle, the intersection of, of Route 60 and Route 1. Uh, this is 16 and 1. Uh, Bremen Street, again, an in, important interaction with Day Square in East Boston and, of course, traffic from Logan Airport, the two tunnel, three tunnels, uh, Route 1A and, and our site, of course. Um, I'm going to talk about Route 1A now, which is our, which is our front door and, and, and an important access point for the resort, as I've indicated. Um, uh, the, the improvements uh, are to this section of 1A. This is Boardman Street which is an important access route, route to the town of Winthrop. 
uh, uh, particularly from the, from, the, from the north in the morning and from the south in the afternoon, uh, and, and vice versa, uh, people exiting, uh, exiting Boardman to access the city of Boston and points north. Here's a photograph of that same area. This is Route 1A. Uh, these are the oil, oil tanks, the, the uh, Suffolk Downs Oval, the barns. The Mohegan Sun site is right here. This is Revere Beach Parkway, which heads off to the beach. This is Winthrop Avenue. Furlong, our main entrance, is here. Apologize for shaking. I'm actually not that nervous. I, maybe it was the coffee, or maybe I'm old. Uh, this, I am probably both. This is Thomasella Drive, about which we've spoken quite a bit. It's the Orient Heights neighborhood. This is Chelsea Creek. Uh, it, it, we'll hold it there for a second. These, um, the creek. If I can just interject one thing. Uh, so it's clear, uh, Revere Beach Parkway, as it, as it veers off to the beach, uh, if you were to go straight, that's where it becomes or stays as Winthrop Avenue, which is the actual uh, uh, street that runs past our site there in front of the barns. Just, just so the, just so for some clarity on that. You will at various times hear us refer to Winthrop Avenue or Beach Parkway almost at the, at, in, as the same thing. And indeed, it is the same thing in this location. But as Gary indicated, Revere Beach Parkway pulls off this way. Winthrop Avenue continues to Donnelly Square, where it intersects with Bennington Street coming up from East Boston. This next slide is a, is a photograph of the, of the critical intersection at Boardman Street in Route 1A. Here's the traffic coming from the south heading to points north. This is from the north heading south. This intersection has been a regional congestion point for the better part of 40 years. Um, after the artery was, uh, was finished, this became a regional priority. Uh, and there have been several proposals over the years to try to address it. There has been a police officer stationed at this intersection for many years to pull traffic through, depending upon the time of day. It is an important intersection for the region. It's an important intersection for the city of Boston and for the town of Winthrop. And our plan finally will address that. These next few slides I'll go through quickly because I'm going to ask John Kennedy to go through a computer-generated video of this. But we've got two main options for 1A. This is what we call option 8N. Beginning in the south, Logan Airport is here. This is slightly distorted. I uh, uh, apologize for that. But uh, Logan Airport is here. This is the site where uh, uh, Jim Karam is constructing a hotel, the intersection of 1A and Boardman Street. Uh, Chelsea Creek is here. Uh, there, there is a certain other developments of McClellan Highway here. This plan shows on the red where the new pavement would be and in the green where new landscaping improvements would be. And what this plan features is a flyover of Boardman Street in the northbound direction right here. John will show that in a video and it and will be much clearer to you. But the next few slides show you how that uh, uh, the, the flyover continues through to Thomasello Drive, which is the main entrance to Suffolk Downs, and then on to Furlong with a series of improvements that indeed go nearly to Route 145. That's option 8A. It's what we call our northbound flyover. This plan, 8N, 8, 8, 8 has been developed so that in the event of a potential southbound flyover in the future, it, one can be built, but one's not being proposed indeed. One is not needed. The next, the next present, the next option is option 11. It's a surface option. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a design that, that comes out of uh, some national safety uh, a work that's been done by the Federal Highway Administration and is, is based on a, on, a, on a type of design that they're pushing in their Everyday Counts program. It involves elimination of the grade crossing, of the, of the crossing at Boardman and forcing traffic to go south. Through, through a new jug handle and then head to Borden Street. Uh, it, uh, it offers some safety improvements and some level of service improvements at the intersection that John will show. The next two slides show the same uh, areas uh, as I showed on 8N. As you can see, there's, there's less pavement, uh, less need for additional right of way, uh, and, and there, are some, there are a significant number of traffic and safety improvements that are built into this option. The last slide will show you right through, just as, as we did with the flyover option, right through to, uh, to Furlong, or just past Furlong, uh, as, we, as we did for the, for the northbound. I'd now like to ask John Kennedy, a principal at Vanessa Hang and Russland, to, 
step the Commission through three presentations, one showing the existing traffic on Route 1A, one showing the proposed traffic based upon the northbound flyover, and one showing the proposed traffic based on the surface option. John? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, this is uh, using a tool called VISM. Um, it is a modeling tool which can be calibrated to match existing conditions. To establish those existing conditions, we literally parked a helicopter near Logan Airport at 4,500 feet for an hour and a half, monitoring traffic and, and backups in the corridor from just coming out of the tunnels all the way up to Route 60 um, in, in the Revere Street area. Um, we found that there were about 250 vehicles that were sitting in the queue that could not be served extending back as far as Neptune Road. They're included in what you're, they're, they're part of the basis of this with an average travel time of 12 minutes from Neptune Road up toward Bell Circle on a Friday evening peak. I think. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, can you orient us where yes, is, New, where is Neptune okay. uh, Road? I know yep. Bell Circle is way up past the. Okay. We're going to, well, I'll have to step you through because it's not showing at this point on, the, on the, this display. But the tanks are here. Boardman Street is there. I had too much coffee this morning, too. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this is Route 145, Revere Beach Parkway, Winthrop Avenue, up toward Bell Circle. So I think as we get going with the video, you'll see the entire area. Okay. It will start at Boardman Street. Boardman Street is the focal point of our intersection. This is a Friday afternoon peak, and the signals have been green for a while because you see traffic moving very well through the corridor. But then the hotel site, the Marriott Courtyard, I'm sorry, Marriott Courtyard, coming back toward Neptune Road, right about there. Traffic is stopped on a Friday evening back that far, and sometimes it's even farther. But a lot of that is due to the exit at Neptune Road. Very slow travel time coming up the corridor. There are breaks in traffic because those vehicles are moving when the signals turn green and everybody is catching up because it takes two or three signal cycles to get through. So traffic pulses through. Southbound, you'll notice, is fine. We're coming up on Boardman Street now, and you can see it back up on Boardman Street. Based on, this is the afternoon peak, which is less than the morning peak. The red bars mean traffic is stopped. Traffic is now moving up toward uh, Waldemar Avenue. Thomasello Drive, the jug handle that provides access to the tank farms, continuing to move up the corridor, and you're going to see traffic stopped at a point and through here because of the, the conditions at Bell Circle. This is Furlong Drive, the proposed site access, the exit to Winthrop Avenue, Route 145, over Revere Beach Parkway, and then the backups associated with Bell Circle. We're just going to turn and reverse. You'll see a different series of backups because we're a little bit more into the, into the hour. Some backups would have cleared, some would, would not have and are building again. Again, Winthrop Avenue, Revere Beach Parkway. There is a loop under the highway to go from um, northbound back to southbound. Railroad Avenue, which serves a, a series of local developments. For a long drive again on your left. And again, you'll see southbound continues to flow very well during the afternoon peak. It is not a, uh, southbound is not the problem in the afternoon. It's the problem during the morning. Again, a, sl a, a slug of traffic was just released from Boardman Street. That was the movement. We're back into red signals at the intersection of Boardman Street, which is now starting to move. And then the backups are building on Route 1A northbound or the Burbank Highway. Again, we're into the area where traffic was moving on a green signal, so the filling, infilling, uh, this is where that traffic started from. Okay. That's today. There are 2,200 vehicles heading northbound crossing Boardman Street today on Route 1A northbound, and we're getting that kind of backup. The demand to cross Boardman Street today is 2,450. What you're going to see in option 8 north and 11 is the addition of that 2,450 that wants to get through 
another 250 associated with general background growth and known developments in the area. This is, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is option 11. And um, then the site-related traffic added in on a Friday evening. So there is about 45 to 50% more traffic northbound. Again, we're gonna hold Neptune Road here. There is no backup that goes back to Neptune Road now. This is option 11, the surface option that really com that goes along with Federal Highway's Everyday Counts Initiative. We're coming back up toward the hotel right here. Again, no backup. There is a break. Signal U-turns are being made at this location. The concept here that's talked about in every, this initiative is simply referred to as Michigan lefts. There are no direct left turns to intersections. Vehicles pass through the intersection to make a U-turn and then come back and turn right. Um, that's what we've done at the lower location. Just passing for uh, the jug handle. Notice three lanes per direction. Part of the plan is to generate three lanes per direction in this case. We dropped some of the traffic at this point into the site and we're still dealing with demand coming into Bell Circle, but we've added the 250 vehicles that we're able to get through Boardman Street plus general background growth. Made some changes to Bell Circle where we're widening, changing the phasing, extending the amount of time that vehicles can actually move northbound toward Route 60. Headed southbound, coming back in, crossing Winthrop Avenue, three lanes per direction, so the movement coming in from Route 145 is a free movement now. It's not merging with the, the, the existing two lanes. Um, down to two lanes, passing for a long drive. Again, things are continuing to move well. At that point, at Furlong Drive, we've added traffic exiting for the site, exiting from the site. So we've got more demand in this corridor than we have under existing conditions. Passing the jug handle, and again, I'm going to. Can we back up just one second? Pause. No, we can't back up. Um, I think part of the Everyday Accounts initiative is the, this idea of eliminating direct left turns um, at, from the main roadway. Anybody headed to Boardman Street on the east side, the, uh, the Hertz pickup area and the Avis rental car place, um, is actually going to go to existing Thomasella Drive where they're going to be allowed to turn around and come back and then make a right turn into Boardman Street. We have done a lot of timing on travel time estimates with this program on option 11 and have found that we're able to even with 50 percent more traffic we're able to reduce the travel time from neptune road through bell circle by about three minutes even with the extra traffic with these modifications um, okay. this is the year 2032 mass dot because of the expenditure being made here and the the amount of work being done have asked that we go to a 20-year design horizon versus the standard 10-year design horizon. Is still going on? And we continue to meet with MassDOT. Um, there are two plans being carried into the supplemental draft EIR that's being filed. These two are them, option 11, which is the surface option, and option 8 north, which is the overpass. This is the overpass option. This requires some taking on the east side of the Route 1A corridor, wall construction. This is the old wall. The overpass was just shown. But again, we're going to go back to Neptune Road. You'll see the same basic conditions that the queue is gone, moving up the corridor. And again, about 45 or 50 percent more traffic than is getting through that Borden Street intersection today. Neptune Road, or that's actually Bennington Street. Coming up on the hotel site, just beyond the hotel site, we start to split traffic up and over Boardman Street and take surface traffic at grade down to get to Boardman Street to reverse direction and even get to Waldemar Road. Coming up on Waldemar, we've got a, a collector distributor system. Traffic is able to peel off to get to the existing Suffolk Downs area and continue on toward Furlong Drive, which will be the main entrance to the casino. We still have to maintain access in this case to Suffolk Downs um, as a separate entity. Again, coming up on Furlong Drive, 
signal controlled, median brake, two left turn lanes and a single right turn lane, and then into Bell's Circle. The travel time distance, the travel time during the afternoon peak between option 11 and option 8 north is about 25 seconds. Option 8 north will get traffic up through Bell Circle 25 seconds quicker than option 11, than option 11 does. I just, there are different measurement points in what we're doing. Um, southbound, again, you can see the backup that's now running into Bell Circle. We put more traffic through Boardman Street rather than meeting, metering traffic back at Boardman Street and at adjacent locations. We're now allowing a lot of traffic to come up toward the Bell Circle area a little bit quicker, which is why there, there were greater backups at Bell Circle in this plan. Uh, the jug candle again, conditions approaching here, right in, right out at Tomasello right in, right out at Waldemar. The overpass itself. Three lanes are being added on Route 1A southbound. When we modeled southbound, we found that the option 11 condition southbound in the morning is actually much improved over option eight and or the northbound flyover only. There are about 300 vehicles southbound on Route 1A today that are sitting in a queue almost back to Bell Circle that are not being processed during that morning peak hour. The addition of the third lane helps, but the action that is being taken to take care of things on Boardman Street hurts because instead of running Boardman Street together both sides, they're going to be split because we're allowing two left turns out of Boardman Street and that's an action that's being taken um, by the Carum development that Jeff mentioned in, in terms of a mitigation. So things improve, but they don't improve to the great, greatest extent that the option eight nor, or the option 11 um, opportunity gives us. It, option 11, I, I believe, saves about two and a half to three minutes of travel time during the morning peak hour southbound into the city. And that's it. Clear. <laughs> well, um, are you able to discuss uh, whether do you have a, prep, a preferred alternative or is that part of um, both permitting and negotiations with the city at this point? Well, it's a state highway. I'm sorry? Uh, it's a state highway. Okay. One a is a state highway. Uh, oh. So the environmental documentation will not have a preferred alternative. It will simply lay out the facts and it will lay out a series of evaluative criteria for mass dot to uh, make a decision on which, which alternative it likes. I think the data shows that the at-grade alternative operates quite well and indeed has some safety features that are attractive. I'm sorry, which one, Mr. Mother? The surface option. The surface option? Yeah. 11. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that's not Mohegan's uh, decision to make. Either uh, option solves the traffic condition for sure. Um, and that's a, to, uh, to Commissioner McHugh's point, that's a good example of where um, we need to be respectful and mindful of the fact that we remain in a permitting process. And there are, there are some things that remain uncertain, but one thing we do know is that we've got a plan that will solve the 1A traffic conditions. There are other issues that are, that are part of the, uh, the City of Boston discussion that also bear on, on those, but uh, the 1A decision, I think, will largely be a mass dot decision. So question, Mr. Mullen. So you're down to two options, it sounds like, with your discussions with DOT. That's is that cor correct? That's correct. There was a third option that is not any longer on the table? There were seven or eight options at one point, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the Environmental uh, Policy Act unit uh, asked us to work to get down to as few options as possible. We're now down to two, and two will be presented back to MEPR in the supplemental filing. There is a third shown in the document. That mm -hmm. would be the addition of the southbound flyover yes. by others that would basically show, it shows land takings, it shows overall impacts, but it has not been modeled to this degree. Okay, thank you. So I'm a little bit mindful of time, uh, and I, I don't want to run over the time, so uh, I may, we may accelerate this and, and move through this maybe slightly quicker as much as we could do this all day. Um, there's, there are six more locations we'd like to show you. This is Route 1 and 16. Let me just uh, quickly tell you what's happening here from a regional perspective. This is traffic coming on Route 1. 
if, you, if you're from the north and you're, you're destined for Logan Airport, there's a sign on, 1A, on Route 1 southbound directing Logan Airport traffic to Route 60 through Revere. This causes congestion in Revere, and the, the reason for that is that there's an unsafe condition here for, for patrons to, or for travelers to exit Route 1 at the Riverview Beach Parkway to access 1A. We've got a plan that addresses that. I mean, the same is true the other way, and I'll, I'll, I'll address that in a second. But regionally, this is a significant impact or a significant location that was identified in a study, the North Shore Transportation Planning Study that was done by Central T Transportation Planning staff for the Massachusetts Highway Department in 2003. Here's a photograph of that intersection. This is Route 1. This is the Revere Beach Parkway. What, what, what this is showing is that traffic, the site is here, or several miles away, but here. Travelers will be coming through the Revere Beach Parkway and wanting to get to Route 1 cannot make that move. So people will be forced to go through Route 60, which is something that Revere doesn't want, nor does Chelsea, nor frankly does, uh, does anybody else who will be impacted by that. Uh, what our plan does is it introduces a new ramp here to permit people for the first time to access Revere Beach Parkway from the east to the north. Here's, uh, we've got two options, and the only difference is a slight, slightly different treatment of the median. But the way this works will, will be for traffic coming from the east to the west, wanting to go to the north, will go here, through this break in the median, and access the northbound barrel of Route 1 that way. Similarly, traffic from the south wanting to go east on the parkway, come here, through that median break and go westbound, or eastbound, I'm sorry. So this is an example of a fairly elegant, low cost, but important solution that helps the region. It also helps Mohegan Sun uh, and is a significant improvement. We also have committed to studying this intersection at the request of the Revere, City of Revere in our host community agreement. That's one and 16. The next location are, are some improvements to Winthrop Avenue Revere Beach Parkway at Harris Street. That's this location, which is nearby 1A and is an important local road and also important for Mohegan as, we, as it pulls traffic through the parkway from the west to the east. Here's a photograph of that. Harris Street is here. This is Revere Beach Parkway. The MBTA commuter line is here, it's MBTA bridge. Parkway traffic moves this way. This is an example where Winthrop Avenue continues to downtown Revere this way. Parkway traffic moves here and here. Our plans for this and our desires are to accommodate more people on the, tra on, on the parkway headed to the resort by adding a lane. And the way we do that is add more pavement into the middle. The two different, this has been worked very, very closely with both the city of Revere and DCR and it accomplishes an important objective for all the parties. Uh, the two differences that we've got in the two different plans are the treatment of Harris Street with this plan showing a one-way location and the prior plan showing a two-way location. Then, then next I'd like to talk to you about our site access plans uh, which, uh, which remain in conversation with the City of Boston so I'll caveat that uh, uh, right now but I'll, I'll show you our two main entrances are here and here, Furlong and Winthrop Avenue, our site is here. Um, this is a photograph showing our site down at the bottom of the picture. It's slightly, we, we moved it this way so that you could see very clearly how we're going to access through Furlong and then how we're going to access through Winthrop Avenue. Those are our, those are our main entrances. Here's Furlong. Route 1A is here. This plan calls for the addition of a turnout lane on Furlong. Furlong is a public way in the city of Revere and it moves through here on which we have easement rights which will be used to access the site. The way it works, exiting traffic, we'll, there are two lanes to exit through a new median break in 1A to go back towards Boston and one exit to go further north. All, all traffic will be ent entering this way and exiting the site this way. The next slide is an important intersection for the city of Revere. It's complicated by a a, 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 the meeting of several important roads, North Shore Road, uh, Tomasello Drive, and this is our secondary access to the site, Revere Beach Parkway is here. This largely consists of safety improvements and the accommodation of two through lanes on the parkway at the request of the Department of Conservation and Recreation. 
These improvements have been proposed and worked very closely with the city of Revere. Those two sites uh, and how they lay out on what, the, what Mohegan has proposed, those two entrances, it works this way. Patrons will enter here through a main area here to go, go to this area of the resort or up to the main Port Cochere here. Similarly, they'll do that. We also have access, we are accommodating access from Suffolk Downs through Tomasello Drive in Boston because we must, since patrons come through Tomasello into the shopping center and frankly go through to Winthrop Avenue and, and into Beachmont and, and, uh, and points, points north to the beach. That's how the access points work with the site. This next is Donnelly Square, which is an, an important safety and beautification proposal, which we've agreed to in our host community agreement and is, could be called our transportation hub. The importance of Donnelly Square to Mohegan can't be understated. This photograph, this photograph, which looks upside down, but really isn't upside down, shows the barns, Suffolk Downs barns here. This is Beachmont Station, which is a significant entryway. The MBTA commuter lot is here. This is Donnelly Square. Mohegan has proposed, as shown in this next slide, a series of improvements aimed at, uh, this is a, a, a slightly different perspective. Here's the site. Uh, uh, this is the MBTA station right here. This is Donnelly Square. We've got, this shows pavement improvements and improved conditions for the MBTA bus stops and beautification improvements here to make a welcoming entry for people departing the MBTA into what you've seen previously as the main front door, the main pedestrian entrance of the resort. This is a significant front entrance beautification program that uh, we're working very closely with the city and the Beachmont community. Yeah, let me just uh, add to that, that we have spent a lot of time with the Beachmont Improvement Committee, which is the uh, neighborhood here, to make sure they've had uh, 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 maximum input as to how this lays out. And they've been very, very supportive and uh, have offered a lot of good suggestions for it. Next slide is, uh, is Bell Circle, uh, notorious Bell Circle, Mahoney Circle at the intersection of several state highways. Uh, John spoke about it a lot on the video. We've got a plan that, there's a photograph here of, of Bell Circle. We've got a plan that largely is designed to accommodate 1A traffic wanting to go here, points north to Revere Beach, and also accommodate traffic through the circle, resulting in safety and pedestrian and traffic improvements. Uh, next slide is, next slide will show you how we, similarly to what we're doing at Harris, adding pavement, introducing this new lane, and then introducing improvements here, as well as sidewalk and safety improvements. Uh, Revere High School is in the neighborhood, and as I indicated earlier, a fair bit of what we're doing with the city of Revere is is making these intersections safer and more inviting to pedestrians. The next location is Copeland Circle, another important regional location, uh, there's a f which is here, the intersection of Route 1 and Route 60. Uh, it has been the site of some 200 accidents within the last reporting period and is thought to be one of the dangerous, more, more dangerous intersections on the North Shore. This is a photograph of the circle Route 1 passes through in this location. These are the old ramps, uh, ex, uh, interstate ramps that have been, that were abandoned as part of the highway projects in the, in the past. And what, what our proposal does is it introduces traffic signalization and additional pavement to try to ease the traffic and, and conduct safety improvements in each of these locations to try to create a safer uh, intersection uh, uh, and, and through through uh, throughport area for the city and for the DOT. The next slide shows this is a summary of our roadway improvements. This shows our 21 locations that we are proposing improvements. With the green showing where our level of level of ins, level of service or safety or operational improvement is superior to what over the existing condition, and the white showing where it remains the same. Now you'll note that there are some options that are being carried because, as has been indicated previously, we remain in a permitting condition. But we're confident that each of these intersections, we've got a solution for that it, it improves either level of service or safety at each of the locations at which a, loca at which a solution has been proposed. 
The second leg of our transportation plan surrounds the other side of transportation. I, we just spoke a lot about supply. This is demand. And we try to moderate demand, uh, try to influence demand by driving more people to multiple occupancy vehicles, the MBTA, et cetera, through a, a, a targeted and, and significant approach called transportation demand management. That begins with working with the MBTA and integrating the MBTA into our design. Indeed, Mohegan has taken steps to revise and to develop the design of its facility to open up to the MBTA, as you've seen several in, several, in several different slides. We've dramatically limited on-site on employee parking. We propose targeted subsidies for Charlie cards for our employees. We propose marketing for the MBTA to our patrons. We've committed, Mohegan's committed to hiring a transportation coordinator and to, the, to requiring all of its tenants and indeed its, itself to join the Transportation Management Association, which is a part of every transportation demand management plan undertaken in the Commonwealth. The third part of our program is, is a detailed shuttle program. The first shuttle program is an is a, is a innovative employee HOV shuttle which, will, which is responding to the fact that we've got restricted on-site parking for employees. We call this an interceptor uh, program because we propose to intercept employees at remote locations, put them on a shuttle, and get them to work. Uh, we, we are working with an experienced operator who is who is, whose specialty is to work with employees and work with employers in getting people to work. Um, it will be a performance-based, dynamic program based upon demand, and it will be operated by an experienced third-party operator. We also have patron shuttles, as we detailed in our RFA2 application. We've got Jitney shuttle to, to Logan. We've got patron shuttles uh, to all of the highlights in Boston, the Back Bay, the Theater and Seaport District. We've got a, we're working on an arrangement with the Department of Conservation and Recreation on a shuttle to Revere Beach to take advantage of all that the beach has to offer. We've also got shuttles to local commercial areas uh, such as uh, Maverick Square, which also happens to be an important business area. It's an MBTA stop and it is the site of a future water shuttle, which is an important feature of our plan. And we also have committed to exploring other shuttles in the future at locations such as Harvard Square, Salem, et cetera, which contributed to our surrounding community strategy. And it's one of the reasons why we reached out to Salem and Cambridge to make sure that they were at the table as we developed these plans. The fourth part of our plan is targeted support for water transportation. We've got $100,000 annually dedicated for the Winthrop Water Shuttle. We've got support and we're talking to the city of Boston about supporting uh, the proposal to develop a water shuttle from Seaport to Maverick at Lewis Wharf in East Boston, Lewis Street in East Boston. We've worked on a partnership with DCR to link the Revere Reservation with the Boston Harbor Islands and make some connections between our DCR, our, our DCR, important DCR assets. And as we committed in our RFA2 application, we've got a plan or a proposal to develop an American, Native American heritage education program to the islands. So while, we, while we're, we're paying attention to water transportation as we must given our location, uh, we're, doing, we're doing this in a targeted way in a, in a way that we believe is feasible. We did look at direct water transportation for this location as I indicated earlier. We are on Chelsea, we are on uh, the creek is, is across 1A. We deemed it to be infeasible for, for several reasons. One is uh, competing traffic uh, with, uh, with, the, with the tanker ships. Another are the um, the fact that it, it simply takes a long time to come on a boat in the harbor, given that uh, varies uh, depending upon where people begin their trips. So they don't begin their trips at the dock, they begin their trips at the Faneuil Hall or at, uh, or at the State House or at the Heinz Convention Center, and it takes quite a while. And the, and the third point is, is uh, the weather. We think that the weather will be a significant deterrent to actual water transportation, but nevertheless, it's an important part of our plan and it's one that we feature and we, and we want to talk to you about today. The fifth part is our commitment to bicycle and pedestrian accommodation. We have committed to developing bicycle accommodation on Saratoga and Bennington and on Winthrop Avenue. The Saratoga and Bennington connection, as shown in the next slide, will, will complete a beach-to-beach -beach connection that began many years ago in East Boston with the development of Piers Park through the old CSX right-of-way uh, uh, terminating here. We've got, there are bicycle 
accommodations planned by others here in red and Mohegan Sun plans to pick it up here at Constitution Beach to complete a seamless bicycle connection between Constitution Beach and Revere Beach. That will permit all of East Boston and Revere to enjoy these two, three, four important recreational amenities by bicycle. Um, we've also committed to hubway accommodation should that program be extent, extended to, to, eat, to, to Revere. We've committed to bicycle parking spaces. We've committed to uh, showers for our, our employees uh, who choose to move by bicycle. And we've committed to bicycle accommodation on Winthrop Avenue to and through the site. Those are the primary features of our transportation plan. We believe they address every conceivable type of transportation, and uh, we're very proud of it. I'd like to now ask Gary Luteritz to summarize our presentation and be prepared for questions. So my summary, my summary, quite frankly, will, will be very quick. And um, uh, as I stated in the beginning, uh, as, a, as a, your visit showed to our, to our site in Revere, we've got a, a very superior location. Uh, we've got a development that really takes advantage of transit, uh, uh, and uh, we're, we're very proud of that. We think it's a centerpiece to our, our traffic and transportation solutions. We've got regional traffic solutions that also solve longstanding problems, and again, all of which is privately funded. We've got a thoughtful support process for every practical mode of transit. We've got a cooperative approach that we've taken in, uh, in, uh, in getting feedback from our surrounding communities and our neighborhoods. We've got a workable plan. I think it may be most important. It's a workable plan on which the commission can rely. So that summarizes our, our presentation today. Uh, I know there were not a lot of questions uh, during, but I think we have a little bit of time left, perhaps. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. And um, would encourage you to do so, if you wish. All right, thank you. That was very helpful. Commissioners, questions? Uh, I had a question about um, the mitigation plans, which are extensive. All of those would be completed before an opening? Well, we haven't, uh, in our, in our we, there's an extensive uh, list of when, when they must be done in the Revere Host Community Agreement. We think they all can be done. They, we've not yet committed in the Revere Host Community Agreement to doing that. We expect that that will be one of the outcomes of the MEPA process. Mm -hmm. I will say that, I mean, one of the reasons why I provide the answer that way is not all mitigation is the same. So we've got 21 locations, and something we do at Day Square, for example, might be less important than the Route 1A improvements, but we're certainly planning on completing the Route 1A improvements before we open the casino. So you're committing to those mitigation uh, plans that would improve 1A. That's the others? Well, I'm not saying one way or the other because mm -hmm. I don't know what the, permitting out what the outcome of the permitting process will be. I'm saying mm -hmm. that that is, um, it's a likely outcome, but it's mm -hmm. not yet been committed to. Yeah, notwithstanding uh, the, 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 the issues we may have with permitting, which we, you know, we don't expect any that would roadblock us in the process, but we would expect to finish these uh, when the resort opens. Okay. I think the city of Revere wants to address that. Oh. The city of Revere might want to sp speak to that, Commissioner? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here. Good morning, Brian Falk from Myrick O'Connell, Council of the City of Revere. Every transportation mitigation that was discussed under the host community agreement must be completed prior to opening with the exception of the Route 1A improvements. All others under the HCA must be done prior to opening. With the exception of the one, the um, A1A. Route 1A improvements. Yes. Understanding that at the time we enter the host community agreement and currently mm -hmm. we've got two options and ultimately mm -hmm. it's up to MassDOT to determine uh, which one is done and, and the order in which it's done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's with regard to the host community agreement, but Mr. Mullen, you just said that they would be, one option or the other would be completed. Uh, I, I believe that's what you just said. I did. Okay, so did. you're saying, okay, you're looking at it from two different aspects. Correct. And I'm also mindful of the fact that there, there, uh, 
there are, there are some of our improvements are also in the city of Boston uh, and, and, and may not specifically be, be addressed at Curtis Avenue or, or, or Bennington Street in Saratoga mm -hmm. uh, with respect to, in particular with the host community agreement in Revere, so mm -hmm. I'm mindful of that as well. Um, but we do expect that the improvements will indeed be completed uh, uh, within that schedule. Mm -hmm. You had projected opening um, in, in your application. Um, has, has that changed at all? Or are those projections still They're, solid? Well, it's somewhat dependent upon the licensing process, of course, and the weather conditions. But uh, the, the, the schedule for construction of the resort is 30 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're pretty confident of that. It's moved. Um, only due to the fact that we've not, we're now projecting a later start date uh, to accommodate the licensing process. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the commissioners? Um, the figure that you um, mentioned in your, uh, early in your presentation of 45 million uh, in, in private funding for all of these improvements, um, I, I, I gather that would be the, uh, the more costly option 11 or 8N, is that, is that a fair statement? Well. Or is that the likelier? Um, their estimates. Yeah. I think we'll find that the infrastructure improvements that we've proposed will cost more than $45 million as a practical matter. Um, there are cost differentials between 8N and 11. Uh, we're not uh, yet confident which direction it will go in, um, but we are confident that regardless of the option uh, will exceed that number with respect to the amount of infrastructure that's provided as a result of the resort. Okay. Um, we also, as, as Mr. Lutteritz mentioned, we, we're, we're also becoming very familiar with, more familiar with traffic uh, uh, terms and, uh, and issues than, than we probably um, expected at the beginning of this process. And uh, with the our category two um, uh, license, um, the, men the, the, the topic of our, about median cut has, has, has become, perhaps for other reasons, um, not as easy as it sounded initially. Um, and you, you, in your presentation, um, you also mentioned uh, a number of median cuts were uh, in order to give way for, for those improvements. Can you just speak in general as to how um, Mass DOT is going to uh, likely um, review and analyze, and I, 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 uh, and I know it's ongoing and fluid, but um, um, I'd be interested in your thoughts relative to this um, dynamic. You know, John's been, been doing most of the conversation with the department. I might, I might ask him to address that okay. and answer that question. Okay. I think uh, we've got several medium breaks that are proposed. Um, Two are at the 1A and or the Route 1 and Route 16 interchange. Um, those were both medium breaks that were proposed as part of the CTPS study for the short range and inter, inter, intermediate range plan for improvements to provide that access. So we're carrying on that. Who, I'm sorry, whose study? This is a study by the Central Transportation Planning staff in 2000 as part of the North Shore Transportation Study that had Mass DOT or Mass Highway at the time. Um, participation in that program, and it was the plan that was put forward. Um, we're piggybacking on that. There is a very significant safety improvement that's realized with those ramps because the movements that we're providing are now there today by many vehicles. They simply turn right off of the ramp and head to Webster Street and make a U-turn and come back, which is causing some very serious backups in the Route 16 corridor. So again, these would be improvements. DOT has seen them. They're on board with them. DCR has seen them, and they're on board with them also. Um, the other medium break we're proposing is at Furlong Drive. Or, and DOT is also on board at that as, as part of all of the modeling that we've done, the analysis that's been completed, and the like. There is an existing median break at Suffolk Downs today, um, Thomasello Drive. In one case, in option eight, that's being closed. In option 11, it's being signalized. So again, we're, we're really talking about the two median breaks in the, uh, in the Route 1 and 16 interchange, one at Furlong Drive. The secondary, actually the, the fourth break, is as part of the U-turn plan um, south of Bourbon Street. 
And again, this is part of that Everyday Counts initiative where signals will operate in two phases, not to get technical. Very efficient. It's the most efficient traffic signal that you can have. It simply operates with a main street and a side street or a turning movement, and it works very well. So those are the median breaks that we're proposing in this case. Um, and that's it. Other questions? Some of the, uh, the other improvements, the, the non-1A improvements, I'll call them, uh, are those identified in any other previous traffic plans as reviewed by MassDOT or the old Mass Highway? You mentioned that 2000 plan, but uh, in particular, I guess, you know, the, I think it's junction with 60 and Route 1. Uh, are those identified or were those, I guess, a combination of your efforts to identify those problem locations based on history, but also where you see your patrons coming from? Copeland, Day, uh, Bell Circle, 1 and 16 are all significant regional locations at which improvements have been proposed from time to time over many years. 1 and 16 in particular was studied as a result of, as a part of the North Shore Transportation Improvement Study about which John just mentioned as one option of several options uh, that were advanced, none of which have, have been done to date. Boardman Street and 1A has been proposed to be completed, as I indicated, for the better part of 30 years. Uh, those, I would say, each of those locations have seen proposals from time to time for many years. The improvements at Furlong and at Winthrop Avenue and Tomasello, not as much, because those, I think, are more particular for the site. And I think that's how I'd break that down. Okay. You, and I wouldn't expect a huge amount of your patron traffic is gonna come from the water access that you talked about, but uh, uh, how far away is this, uh, the, is the, the Winthrop dock or Ferry service? In terms of time or, or, or distance? Oh, it's a few miles. I mean, the, the Winthrop, uh, moving people by water has been a, a, an important initiative at the town of Winthrop for a while. And that was a thought to be a helpful way to mitigate the impact of that town by the resort and a long standing community objective, which is why we supported it. It could be that ultimately we run a patron shuttle to that dock for some type of recreational opportunity while visitors and patrons enjoy the resort. We don't, we're not that far along. Um, but we are not proposing that particular um, location to be a, a um, to be, to relieve or to move a lot of patron employees. I think the seaport dock that was proposed uh, a couple of years ago and, and it continues to be worked on between World Trade Center and Maverick offers an opportunity for patrons in the seaport to get on a boat to get to the Blue Line, to get to the resort, or to Wonderland. It's much more of a regional improvement, and that's why we're supporting that. We'll point out that um, it's hard to move a lot of people quickly, um, sometimes in the harbor, given some of the constraints. Um, and uh, we um, We've shied away from doing that given the constraints of our site, as I indicated. Uh, I had one other question. In your, in your host community agreement with Revere, you talk, and this is focused on the improvements on 1A, you talk about a, uh, and I didn't jot the full context of it down, but maybe you can help me out with it, an equal or superior improvement. Who, who's the judge? Is it MassDOT as to whether there's a superior improvement above what you're suggesting? Certainly, MassDOT owns the, owns the facility. Uh, ultimately, we'll make the decision in cooperation with the permitting agencies. I think we'll see their decision in their Section 61 findings as part of the MEPA analysis. We've guided that decision a little bit with, or, or to a, a, a fair extent with the analysis that's been done. And you'll see the alternative analysis laid out in detail in the environmental document. And the ballpark figure, uh, I think, is consistent. You talked about approximately $25 million set aside for the 1A improvements. Is there any chance the price tag goes a little bit higher? And is the applicant committed to, to bumping up the budget if they have to? 
the applicant is committed to the mitigation, not, uh, and the applicant is committed to the results that are displayed by the mitigation, not to the numbers. These numbers are the best that the engineering team can do at this conceptual level. It's, it's part of the, the, the answer I gave to Commissioner Zeniger. Uh, I, we have every confidence that this will cost more than the $45 million, partly due to the nature of the, just the nature of the project uh, concept. Um, but Mohegan is not proposing to uh, cap its exposure at that amount. W what Mohegan is proposing to do is to perform work at 21 intersections that have been studied in detail within the study area, each of which offers a, an improvement uh, in one way or the other and a solution and to get those done uh, uh, before the resort opens. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I just had one uh, question about the uh, mass transportation. The T is uh, typically shut down between about 12.30 and 5 a.m. and it runs on a reduced schedule on weekends and holidays when interest in attending the casinos may be at its peak. Have you, have you talked with the T about those issues? Sure. Uh, you know, we, I would say uh, Mohegan is a strong supporter of the governor and mayor's proposal to extend late night service uh, as an initial point. Um, the reason for our shuttle uh, uh, is to make sure that we respect, we respect the fact that we've got a 24-7 operation and we've talked, actually talked a lot about Massport because they run a similar type of operation where people are departing from Braintree or Framingham or Anderson Station in the north at 3 and 4 a.m. Um, as to the weekends, um, you, you know, whether or not it's realistic to add service and increase the headways at the MBTA on the weekends is something that we've talked less about. Um, but I also think that the nature of the, of the type of travel on the weekends doesn't really call for that right now. Um, I will say that uh, should we see a dramatic increase in patrons who want to use our resort via the MBTA, that's certainly a conversation we can have but it's not one that's anticipated right now. Well, what is it about the nature of the weekend travel that doesn't oh. lend itself to tea? No, 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 they, they do want to move the tea, they do want to use the tea, but the same, not, kind of, not the same kind of headways or schedule demands. So you're running you know, five minute service in the right. AM peak on, the, on Mondays through Friday and right. perhaps 15 minute headways on the weekends. I thought the question was whether or not we'd be looking to advocate for increased headways on the weekends to match the AM or PM peak and I, I just think the way the patron travel is during the weekend probably doesn't demand that right now. That's all. Okay. Just realistically. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, in, in your presentation, you mentioned um, that mass DOT may go to a two-way tolling. I didn't um, talk about that. Which, which uh, seems hard to fathom, um, but, but, but nonetheless, you know, they, they might come up with, a, uh, with that um, scenario. Uh, if they do, I'm curious, kind of, where, where would that take place? But more importantly, what would that do to your projections and your improvement plans, plans, or, or you know, um, trip generation, et cetera? So um, maybe two. It's, it's two questions, and I'm going to ask John to answer the second part. MassDOT's plans to move to all electronic tolling call for tolling in the Sumner and Callahan in two ways in the t in the Williams electronically. So the conversation that is going on and the procurement that's going on now to convert the uh, current tolling system to a, to a cashless program is going to feature that. So we, we know that and we're anticipating that in this plan. The modeling that we did was done based on traffic counts, actual traffic counts, when the one-way tolling condition. We, the MassDOT tolls westbound in the Williams and doesn't toll the Callahan at all. Um, in terms of the future, it will probably result in flattening out the, the dimension. So you're, you're going to see less diversion of traffic since people won't be seeking to avoid a toll. That's one theory. And it's something that we've planned for, we're anticipating, uh, but we don't expect a, a measurable impact on the traffic numbers. And John, if you have something you want to add to that? I think. The, the application of two-way tolls in the Sumner Callahan would actually have a greater impact in terms of our, our trip distribution pattern. We don't see much of a change coming in using the TED because we're tra where that traffic is coming from and, 
and its accessibility to the Sumner and Callahan area. Um, we're projecting um, about a 7 to 11 percent difference in use of the, um, the tunnels with more traffic leaving the site using the Route 16 corridor, more entering through the, uh, through the tunnels, the, the Sumner and Callahan complex. That might balance to more of a, a 10 to 12 percent each direction and a 10 to 12 percent each use of the Mystic Valley Parkway or Route 16 corridor. And I think that's one of the things that we're going to continue to evaluate as we go forward. Um, the plan does appear to be going forward at this point. So or the, the, the automatic electronic toll collection program is going forward. All right. Uh, I think we wanted to offer our consultants an opportunity to ask any questions that uh, may have been unanswered to just, this point. Uh, just a few. Is, is this working? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, on the Route 1A uh, analysis, uh, you spoke a lot about Bell Circle, um, and it appears that there's modest uh, improvements to Bell Circle. And uh, are you concerned that you may just be moving the traffic problem up to Bell Circle? And those times you indicated from Neptune to Bell, is that to Bell Circle or through Bell Circle? Okay. It's actually through the, um, the south leg of Bell Circle, the south circle itself um, proceeding through. Um, we are uh, about half of the traffic in the 1A corridor splits to continue on Route 1A North, and the balance goes on Route 60. And I think what we're trying to address is an operational issue the, on the, the portion of the traffic that's actually headed toward Route 60 that blocks access to the right turn lanes, the way things are being set. It diminishes the capacity at the beginning of the green cycle or the green phase northbound on Route 1A. When we put more traffic in those lanes, we're able to release more traffic on a cycle-by-cycle on -cycle basis. It also gives us the opportunity to continue traffic northbound on 1A route headed to Route 60 for a longer time because the movement continuing on 1A is not going to impede that flow um, by giving it more storage. So we're able to make operational improvements, signal operational improvements within the circle and increase the capacity of that movement that's continuing on 1A, which reduces the queues on the approach. Okay. Uh, on the... Um there, there are some historical commission uh, issues on the parkway. Have, have you uh, talked about those? Yes. <laughs> a, a little bit more detail. <laughs> the medians aren't a contributing element to the historic nature of the parkway. So we've talked to Mass Historic, and, and Rick, I know that you've dealt with Mass Historic quite a bit. It's, 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 uh, we're not expecting to get a definitive statement from Mass Historic until we make our permit applications, but we know that the improvements that are proposed for the parkway, uh, there have been no significant, no, no, no significant issues raised with the, with, the, uh, with the Mass Historic. I think what's really helped us is, is the fact that DCR is in support of the improvements and uh, we're taking care to respect the historic nature of the overpass, actually. We're, that overpass at 1 and 16 is historic, but it's not, uh, it's not being affected by the roadway improvements. We're really talking about a medium break and the, additional, the addition of a, a small amount of pavement, neither of which is a contributing uh, element to the historic character of the parkway. Thank you. Um, on your main uh, driveway, Furlong Drive, is the diagram you showed, is that... Um, what you consider to be your final solution, or is that an interim solution, or uh, where do you stand on that? On that, uh... that's the current solution, and uh, that's the result of a lot of work that's gone in with with the DOT and with the city of Revere. Um, uh, that is what we will be presenting in our environmental review. As to uh, um, oh, that's uh, as to whether it's final. I, as I indicated. Um, we're talking with the city of Boston as well about how to handle traffic that, that must come through the site um, via Tomasello to accommodate East Boston people, people cutting through the site from 1A to 145, and patrons who come through the site to uh, the Stop and Shop and Target Plaza. So there, there could be, it could be that we may find some modifications to that based on that conversation, but it's too early to judge that. Okay. We do know that what we've proposed accommodates 100% of the traffic that comes into the site. 
So you'd be comfortable if that was your final solution? Correct. Uh, can I just sh shift to parking for a second? Um, uh, on the off-site parking, have you identified locations and have any uh, agreements with anyone in terms of uh, satisfying the uh, employee parking? You know, we expect our operator to do that. Um, uh, with respect to lo identifying the locations, we're not pl you've probably got a need for about 750 parking spaces maximum based on the number of employees that work at the site, the number of employees that we know won't be able to access the MBTA, and that's based on a conservative estimate of 30% using the T. We'd like to get that number up, and I know MassDOT would like us to get that number up, um, but we won't know that until we hire these people. We know where they live, and we know how they want to commute. We're gonna try to drive people to the T through the subsidization of Charlie Passes, and uh, it just it couldn't be more convenient given its location. And I think it's obvious that we need to we need to do that. Um, but we don't propose that any of those 750 maximum spaces would result in a built structure. We'd like to try to use available parking capacity where we can, and we're going to rely on our third party operator to identify the best locations based on where our employees are, where they're coming from, and how they want to get to the resort. Um, uh, and, and, and also uh, have some of the pickup locations at key transit hubs, such as Lincoln Commuter Rail and Anderson, for example. Uh, but you said you don't expect to have to build new facilities. I wouldn't expect that. Um, on the it, it wouldn't be a lot different, Rick, than uh, you know, uh, the commitments made by the Turnpike as part of the artery to you know, establish parking at, at places like Wyman Gordon and Grafton, for example. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we're thinking about. Uh, in your existing um, garage, it's our understanding that because it's in a floodplain, it will flood in extreme events. H how does the, the facility operate during those conditions? You know, you're a little bit, um, a little bit beyond my area of expertise. I'm sorry, I, Gary. Gary may have a. I, I think we're talking about an extreme condition, but there is. It is true that we're in a floodplain and we're accommodating that with the design. Yeah, and, and certainly I'm not the, the uh, site engineer that can best answer that, but I can say that um, uh, uh, that is a 100-year uh, scenario that we have planned for under the new MEPA regulations, and uh, we are not putting any operational equipment under the, uh, uh, in that area that would in any way inhibit our ability to run the property. So um, I would expect the property to be certainly operating in an emergency mode, but not in a mode that shuts us down. If, that, if we were to experience that kind of flooding. Thank you. Jason, you have? Yeah, uh, I have one follow-up question. Uh, in response to one of Rick's questions about Furlong Drive, uh, you just stated that uh, the improvements to Furlong Drive would be able to accommodate 100% of the traffic. Uh, can you talk about how you expect traffic to be distributed among the three entrance points? You know, what, what, I, what I meant to say <clears throat> is that the access plans, I, th I thought what I said was, the access plan, meaning the combination of Furlong and Winthrop will accommodate 100% of the traffic. So it's, we're not expecting that all of the traffic comes through Furlong in any event. So we've got, we've got some people are, are going to be coming down Revere Beach Parkway, Winthrop Avenue to get to, um, to get to the site. Is your question the distribution of the traffic vis-a-vis -vis Furlong and Winthrop? Those and two? As well as the, the, the uh, well, well, just the vehicular access, there's also the Tomasella Route 1A access in the city of Boston. You're looking for the split. Correct. John, do you have an idea on the split? Thank you. John does. The analysis has been assumed that um, there will be no entering movement or no exiting movement at Tomasello, that all vehicles approaching the site will either use Furlong or will use Revere Beach Parkway, Winthrop Avenue. It's about an 80%, 20% split, with it. about 80% of the demand using the, uh, the Route 1A corridor via Furlong, and the 20% using the, the North Shore Road and uh, Revere Beach Parkway Winthrop Avenue corridor at Tomasello. Just one other um, follow-up question on, on the MEPA filing uh, schedule. 
do you have a, a, an expected time when you'll be filing your uh, supplemental? We're expecting to file. Oh, I'm sorry, Gary. Yeah, we, we, um, uh, we're expecting to file sometime within the next several weeks. Um, while I don't have a specific date that I would give you today, that uh, you know we're uh, it's, it's uh, uh, near completion and nearly ready to file, and uh, we'll want to make sure it's a it's a uh, you know the right submission when we do. So we're probably several weeks away. Um, do you do you are you anticipating then filing a final uh, uh, EIR after that? We are, we are anticipating that yes. Um, and um, uh, we think we'll have a filing that, that will justify that. We have no more questions. All right. Anything further from the commissioners? Just, just one final question. Uh, in, in, you allude to your plans. Um, they're essentially you're constructing a rotary in front of the access point to the to the parking garage and, and port crochet of the building. Uh, I guess why that option over a signalization with all of that traffic coming into that one access point? John, I, it's an on-site improvement, so. But it, it's an on-site improvement that we recommended um, to the site engineers and the, the architects. We feel it is a very, um, it, it is the correct solution for what is there, given the number of approaches and, and the recognition of the Port Cochere and the desire uh, just where traffic is coming from and where it's going to. Um, we think it will work very well as it's designed. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think we're finished our questions. Is there any final word that you'd like to uh, offer? Well, I certainly appreciate your kind attention. I know it was a, it was a long presentation. and. Uh, there's probably many more details that we could get into with it, but uh, thank you for your attention today, and, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you thank for you. Uh, explaining it to us. These are, are uh, important issues uh, and uh, uh, obviously involve a lot of uh, detail, but, but uh, numbers of people are watching, and these are critical issues. So thank you for, for helping us understand them. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll now be in recess. It is uh, 12.15, and uh, in our... Uh, in our um, publicity with respect to this meeting, we said that the next presentation would begin at 1.30. So we'll be in recess from now until 1.30.